Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, thanks for coming. As uh, she said, uh, my name is Hugo, and for the last uh, three years and a half, more or less, uh, I've been working on uh, a personal research involving uh, aviation security. Today, I would like to share with you some of the results of this research. So, let's go. Um, this is uh, not the typical uh, slide where I explain who am I, but uh, the idea is to explain what am I. I think that's important for uh, what I'm going to talk about because on one hand, I'm IT security researcher as most of, most of the people sitting there. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also a commercial pilot uh, for the last 12 years and I needed both of these uh, knowledge in order to face this research. Even being commercial pilot, I had to study a lot for many time uh, in order to deeply understand aircraft systems and the inner workings. So take into account that for the rest of the, of the talk, as most of the concepts will be new, and I, would be, I won't be able to explain everything. Okay, the agenda for today, I've divided the talk in two different parts. The first, the first one, we will see how to get uh, vulnerabilities on systems on board the airplane, and after that, we will see how to use those vulnerabilities in order to exploit those systems uh, on board the airplane. Just before beginning, I know by the end of this talk, most of the uh, subjects will be not properly explained, but I have time constraints. As aircrafts are quite different from computers, and I'm sure that not everybody here has all the background, all the knowledge necessary in order to understand everything. And also because due to safety reasons, I cannot give in, get into the details on, for example, the vulnerabilities or the exploits, because most of them, not to say all of them, are still um, pending to be patched or solved. Okay? So let's get into part one, where we will see how to, how to get those vulnerabilities and how everything started. Everything started, as I said many years ago, with one question. Uh, the question was uh, if I would be able to convert for security, from the security perspective, an airplane into a computer, so get some of the onboard systems, try to find vulnerabilities, develop the, the exploits, and uh, see uh, what may I be able to do once exploited the onboard systems. The question to this answer was uh, yes, and many years later, this is a brief map of uh, the main topics I have uh, been covering or I'm covering right now or I plan to keep doing research uh, on this time. As you can see, I have divided that on vector, attack vectors, targets, all the common phases of an attack. From all this, today we just can talk about a few points, a uh, few systems, a uh, few targets and a few protocols. Not everything can be covered, okay? Take, it, take into account. This is what we are going to see today. The attack overview for today is, um, I have uh, organized that into the common phases of an attack, which are discovery, information gathering, exploitation, and post-exploitation. For discovery, we will use a well-known protocol uh, called ADSB. For information gathering on the targets, we will, see, we will use ACARS. And for exploitation, we will, we will use ACARS to reach the airplane and exploit onboard system vulnerabilities. After that, we'll see the post-exploitation options we, we can have. So let's start with a brief introduction on ADSB, though I published recently a paper on that, a small post on that. ADSB stands for uh, that uh, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. It's kind of a radar substitute that is being deployed right now all around the world and gives, uh, gives information as position, velocity, speed, identification, and then information to air traffic control and management uh, back on ground. ADSB has a data rate, more or less, approx of one megabit per second, and we will be using that in order to locate and plot targets on a map. Let's say it's like an ARP ping or a 
discovery scan that you can do with Nmap just to know which tar uh, targets are out there. Okay, talking about the DSV security, that's easy, there is not at all. Uh, so you can find almost every kind of attack you can find on other common protocols. Um, back, uh, by the end, on the reference slide, you, will see, you, uh, you can see links to other documents that explain all those attacks. Okay. As I said, we will use that in order to uh, get target uh, selection. And we will use uh, three different sources for this data. First, we will use public databases, um, a lot of people gathering ADSB data and sharing uh, with us, local data using software-defined radio, and um, we will be working all the time on this research with virtual aircrafts, we'll see later, uh, so we'll also take the ADSB input and output of these airplanes. That's all about ADSB security and how to get the targets on a map. Okay. After that, uh, we will use ACARS. ACARS uh, it, uh, stands for Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's been described like an email system between ground and airplanes and also between airlines, uh, ATC, almost everybody involved in aviation can use ACARS to communicate between them. Okay, and we will use that in order to give a kind of operative system fingerprinting of uh, the selected uh, targets by just gathering as much information as possible by getting ACARS data, we will try to get detailed information on, on the available targets. Relating ACARS security, we have exactly the same one as on ADSB. Uh, people, uh, mainly military, are working on some secure implementations on ACARS, nothing deployed as far as I know. Some airlines have tried to develop or implement their own kind of security, like the one I said here. To be honest, I think uh, that cannot be considered secure anymore, anymore, but you can find it if you just gather information uh, from public databases. As happens with uh, ADSB, there is a lot of people just gathering ACARS uh, communications and sharing them. Local data by using software defined radio again, and of course, virtual airplanes. That's uh, what we are going to be using. Okay. Finally, regarding ACARS, uh, I have to mention uh, the ground service providers, which are two big companies that offer worldwide coverage of ACARS uh, related services. We'll see later on part two uh, a little bit more about that. Okay, that's a brief introduction on those two protocols that are not the target of this talk, just some resources uh, we, will, we will use in order to get into the, the airplane. By the end of uh, these two phases, we will, see, we will have a map of uh, uh, available targets, we'll have detailed information on most of them, so we can try to guess which one are uh, feasible for our purposes. Now, the FMS, the Flight Management System, is the onboard system we are going to target today. There are many of them, but we are, uh, today, today we are going to focus on that one. Uh, usually it's consisting on two units, components, a computer unit, that's the one you saw uh, below um, on the left. Uh, which is just inside the flight deck and you don't see it. And uh, on the other hand, you have the control display unit, which is this one with the keyboard and the old uh, screen in green and black. It's used by the um, pilots uh, in order to enter data and get some uh, feedback on the uh, flight si from management system operations. Okay. I also added another image of the electronic, uh, one of the, the primary flight displays of the airplane, you know, all these screens that you can see on common cockpits on airplanes, this is one of them, and some of the data um, output by the flight management system can also be shown there to the pilots. Okay, uh, the FMS, brief introduction. Uh, the goal, our goal is to exploit the FMS, one on board system. The uh, idea is to use ACARS communications to upload data into the FMS and there are, as we'll see later, many different data types that we can try to send into the FMS to try to uh, find vulnerabilities. The different upload options we have are software-defined uh, software radio for local area uh, targeting or ground service providers to try to cover worldwide uh, targets. Okay, the path to exploit, as always, is get the aircraft code, search for vulnerabilities, code the exploits, and then try to deliver them. For that, and for safety, security, and obvious reasons, I don't have an airplane at my apartment, we will use a virtual environment 
to set up virtual airplanes that will use air, uh, actual real code, software, and hardware from different airplanes. So how to get this hardware and software may look difficult and expensive at the beginning, but it's not that much. There are different resources we can, fa we can try to, to use in order to get this, uh, this hardware and software. For example, the always uh, helpful eBay. If you go to eBay and search for airplane systems, on board systems, aircraft, si aircraft systems, you will see hundreds of them. You can always go to some scrappings, like the Russian ones, where you can just point to an airplane and point to the systems you want, and you can just even ask for a hundred kilos of airplane, and you can have almost everything inside. Uh, I also loved, uh, learned to love uh, salesman because of the, uh, these products that are not the airplane systems by themselves, but they interact with those systems. We will see later that they also can help us in order to get detailed information, if not the product itself. And also, if the manufacturers are uh, secure, uh, so you cannot get the hardware directly from them, the software directly from them, you can always face the third-party vendors, which usually have less security and they're uh, eager to sell as much as possible, so maybe also useful. Finally, as always, the resourceful users or former employees are a good source of information to, to try to get, if not the hardware itself, maybe a firmware update. You can always get into a specialized forum uh, of the product you are looking for and say, as happened to me once, yeah, I got this product, but they got a new version, so they don't give me the update of the previous one, so I'm completely fucked up. Suddenly another person says, yeah, that exactly the same happened to me, I'm completely pissed off, uh, but don't worry, I will help you. I have the firmware update you are looking for, and you can have the firmware update of an aircraft system, which is always a good vector. Okay, some examples, for example, you can find on uh, eBay a uh, Honeywell flight management computer for $400. May, may seem quite expensive. We'll see later other examples. Uh, cheaper, like this airline system for just $15. Uh, sorry, uh, $85. <laughs> it will get cheaper. Um, for example, you can always uh, face um, another approach, which is the training software. That's where I learned to love the salesman because on the um, specification of the product, they always try to give you as much information as possible in order to, for you to buy this software. So you can see things like our solution uses the same software that is used by the aircraft, by the actual uh, Rockwell Collins FMS. Usually these training solutions are cheaper also. Uh, the same happens, for example, to Honeywell. High resolution graphics are combined with actual aircraft code to create the training environment of your dreams. Fine. Uh, Tales Aviation also. You can see here an ACAR's uh, aircraft uh, management unit for just $10 on eBay. I got that one, by the way. Uh, the only problem is that it's uh, heavy and it's hard to get it sent back to Europe, but you can for sure find uh, some way to, to get that delivered to you back in Europe or wherever you live. Um, another example of another software, uh, in this case uh, for data link uh, simulation, uh, Honeywell also says uh, below the AirSim incorporates over 95% of the actual CMU and HCU software. So another product, training product with real airplane uh, systems code. Okay, and another one. For example, the first software I got for the uh, flight management system was this one that uh, can you see uh, um, on the top. I got it from a game shop in Ohio for $10 because they thought it was kind of a plugin for the Microsoft Flight Simulator that was not anymore uh, on sale, so I, they just sent it to me for $10. That's how I get the first flight management system code. Okay, fine. Uh, now we have the software, we have the hardware for ACARS management computer, um, uh, units for flight management computers and other systems that we can decide that we need in order to replicate that. So, yeah, it's properly seen more or less. Um, we can set up our lab. For example, in this, in my case, I use uh, a laptop with Inguma uh, security research uh, framework I develop uh, that using Python C types uh, talks with this software. Uh, also, each aircraft, I, virtual airplane aircraft I set up, has its own software-defined radio communication to simulate the ADS-B and ACAS communications, both ongoing and 
incoming and outgoing. And uh, in order to make more realistic the environment, all the virtual airplanes are get, gathering uh, actual real flight data from an, another computer running uh, the X-Plane Flight Simulator, which is a really good flight simulator. And with a plugin, you can get uh, and connect those virtual airplanes with it. So they are, you can really make them fly to see how they behave, not just in ground. That's useful for, for example, the exploitation and post-exploitation. We'll see later. This is a picture. Uh, usually, my lab is not that well organized, but for the picture, I, I improve a little bit. You see this uh, laptop with a explain. This huge laptop is the one running explain. The middle laptop is the one that usually takes care of all the software defined radio uh, stuff. And the small one uh, usually has the research environment, uh, some virtual airplanes, and it's connected to the other two. Also, you can see some autopilots and other hardware like a Raspberry Pi I use to run separately other systems and components where I need that. On the top of that, you can see a small ADSB receiver and the USRP, uh, so what defined radio peripheral and the antenna. Okay, so we have our lab set up. We can set up virtual airplanes using real code, real aircraft. We have real communication using so what defined radio, and we have our environment to try to find vulnerabilities to the airplanes. Everything ready. Let's try to find the vulnerabilities. Okay, so. What uh, we have to face in order to find vulnerabilities on the flight management system, computer mainly, is that uh, we have many different vectors, uh, approaches, which are the different data types that can be uploaded into the FMS via acres. There are many flight management system manufacturers. Each of them has models and different versions. Um, so we have to try to cover as much as possible of them, the architectures. Uh, usually, real hardware uses kind of power PC or other systems. Our lab is using different code, but also depending on the system, if we are targeting the FMS of real hardware, real code, but compiled for uh, the x86 platform. The language, that's funny. I don't know if you ever tried to do reverse engineering on, a, on an ADA uh, binary. I did, and I, and I, I got a, a, <laughs> a manual for that because I had no idea how that language uh, was. Another problem we have is the operative system. Uh, this is real-time operating system realm. Uh, it's mainly for the older devices, they use uh, the so-called digital engine operating system, which is uh, an older real-time operating system developed together by, if I'm not wrong, NASA and Honeywell back on the 70s. And on the most modern devices, they are moving to other real-time operating systems like VxWorks. Okay? Also, as our vulnerability and exploits are going to be delivered through via ACARS, uh, we have to take into account that ACARS has a delay, a average delay of 11 seconds, more or less, approximately. The size of uh, the maximum size of an ACARS message should be around 220 characters, and you can use up to 16 of them that will be uh, merged together uh, up in the flight manager uh, in the ACARS management unit on the on the airplane. At least for in order to deliver the exploit, you have to take that into account. After that, if you take control of the ACARS incoming messages, you can just forget about this. But at least for the exploit delivery and the first stage of the payload, you have to take that into account. Also, looking at the images, you have you, you see that the ACARS messages are usually encoded. So even if you uh, prepare your ACARS message, malicious ACARS message, you have to take into account that you have to encode that in order to uh, upload that into the uh, airplane. And after that, it will be decoded and um, it will be transformed somehow until it reaches our final system, in this case, the flight management system. Okay. So, which kind of data can we send? This graphic here, um, uh, offered uh, to us by CETA, we'll see later who is CETA, uh, shows up some of the standard information sent and received by an airplane during a normal flight, all of the phases of the flight, from taxi to landing and, another, and again taxi, okay? Um, you can see two aircraft. Uh, that's what we are interested in because that means the, the information is being sent to the airplane. Okay, you can see that a lot of information is being sent and exchanged between airplanes and ATC, uh, traffic control, uh, during a normal flight, but during takeoff and landing, which are the most critical phases of the flight. Also, even if you see a lot of informa uh, information being sent here, take into account that this is just the normal operations and the normal communications. 
Um, also, during exceptional conditions, additional information is being sent. Airlines also send and receive information using ACARS, also can be used. Uh, maintenance equipment also use ACARS, all other information that can be used. A lot of information can be, can be used. I mean, the attack, the surface is quite big. Just get one of those and start passing or whatever, the favorite procedure. Okay, now uh, it's uh, time for a demo of uh, this virtual environment I have set up. I will show you the Inguma framework. I have the specific version for this um, development research, okay? Here, okay. This is uh, the Inguma framework. This is the first tab you can see on the left that there are many tabs, networking, terminals, reversing, exploiting, and planes. Planes is the important one, the one that you won't find on the public available uh, version of Inguma. Here you can see the IP addresses of all the computers that set up my laptop, okay, the ones I showed before. Here we have many terminals. This one actually is showing all the data being received by X-Plane Simulator and being sent to the virtual airplanes to make them fly. Okay, we have another terminal with a radar tool, reverse engineering tool that I use in order to reverse engineering uh, mainly uh, debug the, software, the code while sending the malicious crafted messages. And on the last one, I just, I don't know if we be able to read that. Let's wait until I highlight that. Yeah. Uh, this is just the command prompt of the post exploitation agent uh, that we will see later. And I just have uh, always a terminal to try to manage the airplanes once exploited. On the reversing tab, we have uh, some code open for static analysis. Uh, to try to follow what's uh, going on. You can see the functions, the imports, the exports, uh, the sections, the normal stuff, okay, of uh, this binary. As you can see here, this is a normal Windows binary because this is one of those codes that use real aircraft code but have been ported into the x86 platform. Okay, the exploiting tab I use uh, mainly for the um, passing stuff uh, you can see that I have ACARS and ADSB uh, different uh, probes. I have here selected the ACARS, and each of these fields will be modified and sent into the virtual airplane to see. Okay. Now, back on the important one, the planes one, on the right, you will see that we have three tabs, ADSB, ACARS, and exploitation. On this ADSB, actually, right now, we are seeing some airplanes being gathered by software defined radio on the Berlin... Uh, area uh, and detailed information we can gather by just sniffing a little bit of ADSV. We can also face this other application that you can find on internet that allows you to have a broader coverage, in this case worldwide, more approximately. Um, so we can also face additional targets. After that, we go into the ACARS tab. Once we have selected some targets, uh, we are not selecting real targets, but uh, anyway, here we can see the information, ACARS information being gathered by public databases and also by our software defined radio. Uh, on the middle, you can see messages. I have changed the names to keep a little bit of safety. And the mouse, the pointer, is now facing those two airplanes, are airplanes that are being uh, monitored by this application. Uh, the longer they are monitored, the best information we have of them. And um, um, while I gather information, I tend to classify them in blue, so I don't have exploit for them, or red should be potentially uh, vulnerable to my exploits, okay? If we double click on one of them, the red ones, we can see also detailed information of this airplane, specific airplane on a map, as we saw earlier. This is just an example. This is the exploitation tab, the final tab. Here we can see on the left, uh, we have created three different uh, virtual airplanes, called uh, Enrance 1, 2, and 3 with different uh, flight management code, okay? And on the right, we can see different tabs also with um, some data and tools to work with. For example, this one is to, uh, the one that we are seeing now, it's uh, for handling the FMS. We can start, stop FMS code. We can, as we see now, edit with an XMS email editor some of the data that the FMS is loading. I also have kind of a cheat sheet of the systems involved on this research, some of them just to don't get lost, as you can see, it's quite complex. 
And just in case I don't have the X-Plane and the other laptop, just for a quick test, I can also run the uh, Flight Gear Simulator on the same laptop uh, with uh, 777, for example, to feed data to any of the virtual airplanes. Also, we have some detailed information. Whoops. Uh, yeah. Before uh, that, we also had all the um, APIs of the binary uh, so that we can try to interact with them and see what options do we have. This is a kind of a primary plane display. You can see a drunk pilot flying over Berlin right now. Uh, please keep in mind that this erratic flight that he is doing right now, it's just to monitor in real time visually what's the plane doing, speed, attitude, altitude, and things like that. It's just to monitor, okay? And actually, he's flying drunk all around Berlin. This acres uh, tab allows us to, we have a lot of acres messages just classified, so we can select one. And below, we will have kind of a template of an acres message related to road clearance or whatever. Uh, so we can modify and try to send and see what happens. Okay. Finally, everything, all of this is just to find vulnerabilities on uh, airplanes. So if I press play, I get a real FMS code running. And we will see right now how to upload, manually load, a proof of concept of a crash of a real FMS uh, system. So we just tell the, the FMS to load some data I have prepared for them. And you can see that the FMS automatically crashed. And we have the 41, 41, 41, classic 41 um, of a crash. After that, we have to, take into, to look if this vulnerability is exploitable or not. Okay? This is the end of the, of the first demo. By the end of this demo, we have the virtual environment, the running code the, of the FMS, and vulnerabilities. So now it's time for part two, plenty of time yet, where we will see how to deliver these uh, exploits into the airplane uh, with all the limitations we have, as we are not talking about common IP protocols, but aviation protocols. Okay. As I told before, there, there are the so-called uh, ground service providers, two main players all around the world, which are CETA and ARINC. The first one is mainly focus on European field. The second one mainly focus on the North America and America. But now, for the last years, they are fighting uh, in their eager to conquer the world. And so they are operating almost all of them in all the, in all the countries. As you can see here, they offer services related to almost every aspect of aviation. You name it. Uh, you have seen CETA for sure when you have to show your boarding pass uh, before uh, boarding the plane. You will see a CETA logo on the machine that's reading your boarding pass. And if you take a closer look, uh, for example, well, when you leave the Amsterdam uh, at the airport, you will see CETA mainly and maybe adding logos all around. Okay? Those are the two players. And they, among other things, offer to airlines, general aviation, to anybody that wants to pay that, a service to uh, be able to deliver and receive ACARS communication of all the airplanes of their fleet. How? OK, these people are fighting, as I said, for the world domination on aviation services. So they have to offer the best services. Uh, among other things, they offer all these uh, easy methods in order to uh, send and receive and manage all your fleet by using ACARS from email clients to desktop applications, web applications, mobility. And if you don't uh, have enough, you can even develop your own SDK, which is good because if you try to use their applications, you're going to find the same problem. You can only send standard ACAS messages. If you want to send something not standard, let's say to trigger vulnerability, you will have to develop your own interface. For example, the SDK uh, comes in handy for that. This is extracted, of, again, from the same document of CETA. OK, also we have the software defined radio. We can use that in order to, uh, to gain more detailed uh, information on the local area we are sitting, because uh, public databases usually are not, don't cover all the, all the ground. So uh, for the local area, you can, you can use software defined radio with the appropriate hardware and software to monitor, deliver um, uh, communications using ADSB or ACARS. Most of you already know what a software-defined radio is. It's a system where uh, instead of having to, buy, having to buy a lot of different hardware devices for each of the communications you want to work with, you just try, have to buy one or two devices. And by programming, you can implement all the specific needs for this communication. 
for example, the one I use, uh, the usual, use on the picture is uh, USRP1, Universal Software Radio Peripheral. And for programming, I use Genio Radio, uh, with LabB, MATLAB, all these. Personally, I prefer to code in Python, but there are many. Here you can see a picture of an open source available implementation draft alpha beta, as you want to call it, of an Acres decoder. So, uh, so I define radio. It's already working for ADSB uh, reception, partially for Acres. If you want to have uh, sending abilities, take into account it's completely illegal, but you will have also to develop uh, by your own. Okay. So. Uh, we, can, we have vulnerabilities, we have the exploits, we have uh, many ways to reach the airplane, uh, and we can deliver exploits. So, common post exploitation is uh, once you've reached the target, you have to consolidate on the target, establish two way communication to interact with the target, and try to expand to other systems. Okay, and after that, go back to discovery and start again. For example, uh, as you can see there, the new Boeing 787. It has plans to switch to VxWorks, and it will host up to 8 to 100 applications, including the Honeywell's FMS, good luck for us, and health management software, oh, sounds creepy, uh, crew alerting and uh, displaying management software. I don't know if you ever exploited a real-time operating system, but what, once you are inside, okay, I will end up there, okay? so. The FMS as a post exploitation that's a diagram of uh, official documentation on flight management system and general avionics. Inter, uh, it's connected with few other systems of the airplane, more, more approximately all of them. Okay? So once you have the flight management system, you can try to target some of those systems also in some, uh, some way. Uh, for example, engine and fuel systems, maybe or not, they can have a computer. You can think, okay, flight controls is just wires. You pull the control column and a wire is moving the, the aileron. Wrong. On modern airplanes, you have the so-called fly-by-wire, which is just a side stick. Some wires going to three different computers that do some calculations, and after that, the computers move the aileron. Can be exploited or not, this is not within the scope of this talk, but as you can see, the FMS looks like the perfect place to start up to conquer uh, all the systems of, uh, of an airplane. Okay? Uh, so, aircraft post exploitation. Um, it's kind of tricky. Uh, as you can see, a picture of the autopilot engage disengage uh, control. This is kind of our enemy, because if we want to somehow control the airplane, uh, we have to try to convince the pilots to don't disengage the autopilot. Good news are that aircrafts and pilots are quite predictable because they follow checklists, we follow checklists and procedures for all the normal operation and also for all the emergency operation. Uh, on the emergency procedures exam of uh, an airplane certification, you have to have 100% of success on the exam. I mean, you cannot miss a single step. So. By having the checklist and procedures of an airplane, you can somehow know what's going to do the pilot under the, some circumstances, okay? Uh, and we have to avoid what it, you can see there on the left, uh, on the top, autopilot disengage. We have to try to avoid that, okay? After that, we have to try to exploit other communication and navigation systems or protocols. As I said, ACARS, ADSB have some limitations, um, if we go over these uh, communications, we can control them, we can overcome these limitations, and also we will be able to send some messages that would be discarded by the systems um, if, not, uh, if we don't take care of that. Okay? As I said, planning and timing is everything. If we do proper timing and proper uh, planning, uh, we can convince the pilot that it's happening something, knowing how they are react, So going to react so we can not just avoid them to disengage the pilot, but also we can even trigger or make them to help us into doing what we want, kind of uh, return or uh, programming, but for pilots, okay? I point you to this address so I know you are going to do this. Um, this kind of pilot programming. And after that, uh, establish a command and control, as always. Establish a two-way communication um, so we can send uh, further actions to the exploited airplane and try to uh, overcome the limitations as the ACARS and ADSB ones. 
Okay. Uh, Simon. Simon is the name of uh, the exposed exploitation agent I have developed. Why to de develop such uh, an agent? I mean, the idea was not just to uh, find vulnerabilities on board the systems, see if they are secure or not, and try to fix them, working with the manufacturers, but also see how dangerous it could be to take over one of those systems. Uh, for that, I had to develop Simon. Good news is Simon cannot be used on real airplanes because I developed that for the x86 platform just for my virtual environment, so we are kind of safe. And um, Simon is a multi-stage payload, first stage to upload the second ones, try to control a little bit the ADSBA cards in order to upload the second uh, stage and the third stage. After that, we gather a little bit of persistence because once on ground, usually you turn off all the systems at some point and we would like to keep the control of the airplane even if they shut down the FMS for a few hours. Stealthness, we don't need to go uh, into a rootkit because as you can imagine and see over there on this cockpit, uh, there is no way you can just try to list all the processes being run on the FMS. So as long as we don't show anything strange on the fl electronic flight displays, all those screens you can see here on the 380 cockpit, uh, pilots won't care about. So we don't need to go into the rookie just to try to be a little bit silent. So what can Simon do once upload it and establish and running on an FMS on board an airplane? We can upload, change, modify or remove flight plans or databases. The FMS has uh, many databases for uh, radio aids, uh, aircraft performance, custom uh, airline uh, data. We can try to modify some of them or just completely delete, remove or uh, upload a new one. We can uh, upload payloads, kind of scripts, we'll see later that. Uh, plugins, which are just additional code that can improve the abilities of uh, Simon or just send specific commands to, to the airplane like, and also it takes care of the two-way communication. Okay. <clears throat> So that's a demo time for the um, exploitation phase. Um, usually that was uh, just uh, this black screen we saw before, all these common prompt with Simon, the name of the plane. But for many reasons, like um, to further highlight the importance of these uh, security issues, um, also in order to improve the visibility of all that, many months ago I decided to to switch the platform. So instead of having one base station running all the virtual airplanes, software defined radio and everything, and another laptop launching the attacks, I decided to move to something more comfortable to wear and take with you, like for example, a mobile phone. Okay, now I feel a little bit like Steve Jobs showing a new device. So um, I'm gonna show you a beta version of an application I developed for Android that we can use in order to hijack uh, airplanes. Oh, I broke something. Okay. Yeah. Here it is. Here you can see a normal Android device with a stock ROM, no routing, no special features, even it has not the standard Android ROM, it has the Samsung one as you can see, okay? And this one is the one running um, the application, okay? So the first thing we have to do in order to hack, uh, hijack, or attack airplanes with a mobile device should be to go to settings, go to more settings, and of course, turn the device into airplane mode. Looks like obvious. <laughs> anyway, just kidding, because I need the wireless, so I, I didn't switch it to airplane mode, okay? No, really. Uh, one thing our application is offering us is uh, notifications uh, from time to time of the potentially vulnerable airplanes that are nearby our base station. The base station is always collecting information on the airplanes nearby. Uh, it gathers anchors information and when some of them reach kind of a threshold like 80-85% of uh, exploitability, uh, they send you a push notification so you can see here. I removed the names. You can see just the virtual ones, uh, but you can see the available potential targets, just to keep inform you on real time. Also a widget, just to, to see at, uh, at any moment which, which ones are, okay? After that, uh, we can just start the application, which is called Plane Exploit. I know the name is not that good, but 
I didn't have that much time to think about it. The interface, the ugly interface, uh, it's uh, also divided into the same phases. We have discovery, information gallery, exploit, and post-exploitation. Um, for discovery, for example, which uh, is to just plot and see which uh, targets we have uh, available. Uh, oops, what did the hell? What the hell I did? I think I broke something. If you don't mind, I will start again. Okay. I'm going to move a little bit. Yep. Whoop. Uh, yeah. Here. Here. Yeah, almost. So, here we are. The first thing we can do is to just start up an external application offered uh, free to us, available in the Play Store, which is called FlyRadar 24. Most of, you, most of you already know about that, that shows up all the airplanes. We can have detailed information on, all, on the airplanes, but also if we have kind of a local target we want to get information about, we can always switch to a metric reality view. This is the, and you can see here all the available targets using just your, your camera and moving around with augmented reality, okay, just to face the local ones. After that, we can just select the target, uh, and in order to be able to keep working, we can just go to share and share the available tar target with our application. As you can see, uh, ah, yeah. as you can see here, the target has been selected. In this case, this one, just a random one, okay? I don't know if it's even uh, vulnerable or not. Uh, we can also just go into this huge list of uh, nearby aircrafts that is being updated from time to time, or we can just select the virtual airplanes, which is what we are going to do today. Okay. After that, we go into the information gathering. This has just one purpose, give us the information we have and one additional button that will tell, please communicate with the base station and tell me if it looks, if this target looks like vulnerable or not based on the information we have been gathering using ACARS. This kind of passive always fingerprinting. We wait a little bit and we say, okay, the target is exploitable, fine. Then we can move into the exploit. The exploit is just a big button where you press and you deliver the exploit and upload Simon. Uh, the video is quite fast, but anyway, uh, this is a virtual environment and real world should be quite uh, slowly, uh, slowly, uh, slower, okay? Now we are supposed to have, an, well, we have on a virtual environment uh, an explo uh, target uh, fly, uh, airplane with the FMS exploited and Simon updated. So we have the post-exploitation phase now. One of them, do you remember the drunk pilot that we saw before? Okay, now we can see this same pilot being flying smooth. What's happening here is I'm using this application, open source. I connected that to the Android API using the phone app. So with the accelerometers, we are controlling the, uh, the, uh, the plane a little bit up, down, right, again, left, and up, okay? Also, if you don't want to be flying manually your airplane, which I understand can be annoying and time consuming, you can just say, okay, please go here. And you can see that the plane directly <laughs> faces them it's always faster, okay? Also, you remember uh, that we could upload scripts? Okay, this is the script editor, which I call the payload editor. Payloads uh, for Simon are divided in two components. First of all, it's a trigger point, and after that, the action. Trigger point uh, defines the, script, the where um, is this uh, action gonna be uh, executed. So we have to select some coordinates. Easy, we go to Google Maps, select uh, some place, we share this place with our application, and you can see here that the trigger coordinates has been uh, established. So we have a point at which the airplane is gonna do whatever we tell them. And, well, maybe not the airplane, but Simon. Problem, it's really hard to make an airplane to fly exactly over those coordinates, so we can define an area. An area uh, by the radius, and also bottom and top uh, boundaries, so whenever the this uh, airplane flies between, within 10 kilometers, be, between 10,000 and 35,000 feet, uh, the action is gonna be uh, executed. Which actions? Okay, I have some of them, like make more friends, which means uh, look for another plane and try to go over them, okay, air to air, hijack. Visit ground, I don't have to explain that one. Um, kiss off, uh, usually means uh, we have been discovered, please uh, uh, self-destroy. Uh, don't leave any clue behind. Apply new flight plan, so we can upload a new flight plan and it will be get executed 
at, at the business circumstances. Chat a little, just opens a two-way communication with the screens and printer of the pilot. So if at some point you want to chat with pilots, apply this action and you can just start, start talking with them. Do introspection, that means try to go into other systems on board the airplane, um, which means just to stay quiet, they are looking for us, and be punkish, the last one, you know, in the films, that sometimes all the masks drop, the lights start to blink, people screaming, and the airplane, that's your, <laughs> that's your payload, <laughs> okay? We just will select something uh, like shh and apply, okay? The action is selected. We apply the, update the payload and the payload is uh, successfully uploaded. Now uh, Simon has another trigger point and whenever uh, the, fly, the airplane flies within this area, this action will try to be executed, okay? Also I will show you some uh, other things I'm developing. Uh, if we turn the, um, the phone, which you cannot see here, um, you can see a map of the targets to have always in view. And also you can see another uh, list, which is toolbox. I have two different toolbox, uh, tools that come in handy when you uh, have to the program uh, Simon, for example, okay? Those tools that are not working within plain exploit, but uh, there are similar tools also available for Android are, for example, uh, Boeing 737 checklist, as I told you, it's really important to know what's going to ha do the pilots if you trigger some action. So just to quick check what's uh, going to happen and plan better your uh, actions, you can have on your uh, phone uh, the checklist of uh, the target airplane. And another one is a professional application used by pilots in order to uh, create, planify uh, flight plans. Uh, flight plans are not that easy. You cannot just point to a point and the plane will go over there. You have to take into account radio aids, altitudes, uh, airplanes, airfields, airspaces, a lot of things. So it's always uh, good to have a tool like this one to properly planify a flight plan. As you are going to hijack an airplane, at least do it properly. So do a proper flight planning, okay? And with this tool, you can always just select the radio aid and the flight area and do a proper flight planning, okay? at the end of the demo. Okay. So, oh, thank you. I know, I know it's been a lot of time, but just uh, two more slides, okay, conclusions, one more slide. Remediation, okay. Uh, usually, uh, on aviation, uh, people tend to speak a lot about security, but they mean safety. So you have three times the same system just in case one fail, or two fails, you have still a third one, so you can keep flying. But they are not meaning uh, security as we all know security. Their systems are not ready to face this kind of attacks, okay? So, in order to fix that, uh, first of all, the next-gen security uh, should be improved. Next-gen is uh, next-generation airspace being deployed and even designed right now. Among other things, it includes ADSB technology and ACARS. So if the, they are still deploying them, maybe we are on time to try to fix them and give them a little bit of security. Just a little bit, please. Also, more systems uh, should be reviewed, looking not for sec safety uh, issues, but for security issues, like the normal vulnerabilities we are all, always facing in our everyday work, okay? Who should take care of that? Manufacturers, because they are making these systems uh, ground service providers, I think it's important because they are sitting in the middle of us and the airplanes, uh, so they should take care of the security of their systems, installations, and also airlines. I mean, airlines, they don't de develop the, the systems, but they are the primary affected because they, uh, they are using these airplanes in everyday basis for their business, so they should take care of. Actually, we are working uh, with my company and runs uh, with EASA, European Aviation Security Agency, to improve this situation. We'll see if the S of security really means security or uh, safety. We'll see. I will tell you, okay? So, some references for you. I know I, I have uh, go, uh, go, I've gone over some of these uh, things quick, but I didn't have time. I already talked too much. So, you have here some references for you to read if you want to go deeper into this. And I would like to thank uh, all these people that has, uh, has helped me somehow. Uh, final word before the questions. You know that behind a good research, there is always a, good, a great woman. So in my situation, thanks to Shelley for, for everything. And that's all.
questions. One. Um, in a real world situation, would you have to be on the plane with your Android phone to, to, to take over the control or can you do it from the ground? I'm sorry? In, in a real world situation, would you, would, you, would you need to be in the plane as a passenger to take over the plane or can you do it from the ground? Uh, I have one rule. Never hack the airplane you are flying on. <laughs> I mean, it can be like, oh shit, it was Little Indian and you are crashing. No. <laughs> No, I can do depending. If you are, uh, you can always be on the ground, of course. If you are using somewhat different radio, you are just limited by the scope, uh, the range of your antenna. And if you are trying to use any of those ground service providers, which is illegal, but if you manage to do, uh, then you have almost worldwide coverage. But you can always do it from the ground. It's not a good idea to hack an airplane while you are over there. No, don't try. Any other questions? Um, what's been the reaction of the industry about these ideas and these exploits? Uh, well, are they scared? Are they saying, well, it's not going to happen? What's the, what's the attitude? Well, we'll see. We've been in contact with them for just a few weeks, months yet, since we announced this talk. But at the moment, I must say that I'm surprised because they are facing the subject. Um, they didn't deny it from the beginning. They had, uh, listened to us. They considered everything and they put us in contact with all the, they are trying to help us to check all this research on a real complete uh, hardware airplane. So they are not denying everything, they are not hiding, they are not saying, they are just trying to uh, collaborate with us to try to see if everything is really working or not. They think that should be, so they are offering resources and they're willing to, to solve the problems. So yeah, I'm surprised, gratefully surprised. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Do you know of any other, any other groups are working on this, playing uh, this? I never, I always thought that I was not the first person to do a research like this one. Maybe I'm the first one trying to get that, to do that public and to work with these authorities to fix the problems. But I, I didn't heard about any other person doing that, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the first one. Cannot well, be. Thanks. Great talk. Uh, thank you. Um, is it likely that it's possible that it's going to be updated on current planes or uh, is this something that's going to linger for many, many years until the planes go out of service because they don't get firmware updates? Um, sorry, no, I think I understood two words. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, is this something that is likely uh, to be fixed on current planes yep. because they get firmware updates or doesn't that just happen because it's really sort of a long and cumbersome process? Yeah, that's a question mainly for the manufacturers, but for my knowledge of the systems, we have two different groups. We have, we have what the so-called legacy systems, the older ones from the 70s. I think it's going to be really hard to fix them uh, in a proper way, but yeah, an initial improvement can be done, but taking into account that it's older code, a lot of things should be changed, and it's really spread all around the world, so it's expensive and hard to, to fix mainly because the software has been tested for years, everybody knows it's, fa it's safe, it works perfectly. A any modification you add to them, you reduce that safety. On modern uh, systems, uh, yeah, you can, it's easy because uh, they have been developed better, uh, they have even a little bit of security in mind, so it should be easier to, to be fixed. But that's my opinion, you have to talk with manufacturers, which are the, the ones that really know their systems. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yes, I was just, I'm not a commercial pilot, or a pilot of any description. I'm just wondering if um, you were flying the aircraft, uh, what options do you have? Can you reboot everything and switch off ACARs so you don't get hacked again, or are you finished? Yeah, a good question, of course. Uh, the question should be, is possible to switch off acres? Let's say it's possible, yeah, that would be a solution for the acres vector. Remember the mind map? Okay, acres is just the one we are using today. Uh, 
if you remember that, it was plenty of other branches. But yet, yeah, in order to face the ACARS uh, approach and to try to avoid that, should work if it's possible. Um, imagine that you discover that your FMS has been actually compromised. Depending on the airplane mode, uh, model, uh, by switching off the, uh, FMS, uh, the autopilot, the activities that uh, the attacker could do uh, would be decreased. Okay. Uh, the idea, the ideal situation would be to completely turn on off the autopilot, the F is everything, and just try to fly the old ways, as the older days, just with the few analog. Um, I'm trying to go back one minute. If you, this is for example the 380 cockpit. Okay, please point me to one older analog system you can rely on, like a compass, uh, an attitude indicator, an HSI, something. You can see maybe here one. Uh, come on, you see that? This is a keyboard and a trackpad, a touchpad. Okay. This is not a control column. This is a, a, hood, a, he, a heads up display. And you don't even see the, uh, the control column. It's over here and it's a side stick using fly by wire, another computer. So you, there is little you can trust. But yeah, of course, by turning off almost everything automatic, flying like the old days, um, you can just uh, reach a safe uh, airport and land again. No, no issue. The, in order for this to happen, the pilot should realize that something is going wrong and think, okay, what can be happening? I'm running out of fuel. No, I think I have plenty of feet. Um, I'm having a stroke. No. Oh, yeah, somebody hacked my airplane. It's hard for pilot to, <laughs> to go into this. Um, but if they manage to do that or they know or whatever, yes, yeah, there are some things they can do. It's, it's not that, that dangerous, at least on some planes, depending on the airplane, the model, there are more advanced ones, less, less advanced ones. You have an old tuple F, there is no way you can hack into that. I mean, everything is going on wheels and no problem. But into a modern like this, 787, 777, 380, all these new stuff. And also the older one, they are always updating, adding new systems, which is even worse because they, they, are, they have to make new systems work together with old system and some other new systems. So you can imagine this is kind of a mess. And security is not something that they take into account when they have to integrate all these systems. It's not that direct answer, but more or less you can, approximately you can know um, the, more or less uh, how it works. Hi. Yeah, uh, you, were, you were first, but don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, if you were to target an, an, an airplane, uh, would you have to do some uh, first do some research to find out what kind of uh, systems does it have, or do can you target a range of planes or a range of models, or it differs from different? It's different from company to com airline to airline. The, the flight systems that they have on board. If I understood properly the question, that's the reason I have, uh, or the, the, the reason for the existence of, of this uh, base station, collecting always information on all the available airplanes. Um, the more information you have, the better, because, for example, a 737, depending on the model, on the airline, on a lot of things, can have different, completely different systems. And you have to try to be certain that at least the ones you are going to target are the ones you think, because, I mean, if you do a mistake, maybe you are going to increase the counter of death, and you don't really want to do that. So, yeah, the best information, I think I can get up to uh, 85 to 90 percent of certainty about a specific target, but uh, I never tried, of course. I have a database of, uh, a database I collected of public information on uh, different airplane models, airlines, and everything, so I I'm always comparing the information I have about an airplane with the information of this database, and whenever I, see I reach a certain uh, threshold, I put it on red or, or in blue. Yeah, but, but the, the vulnerabilities are different for, for different flight systems. Yeah, right? of course. One more question. Yes, so uh, you told us you got some, like, cheap flight management systems off of eBay, did you actually try to port your exploits to those real-world systems, or did you not do that? 
Yeah, to be honest, um, when I faced this research, I always had in mind why I did that for. And I did that because I wanted to know how secure those systems were, and the scope of the vulnerability and everything, not to target real airplanes. So under the same circumstances, I always have choose to get the code, which is the real code, but on a PC platform. So I can do exactly the same my research, but my exploits, uh, Simon and everything will be harmless into the real world, so to keep things safe. Uh, I th uh, so I know that vulnerabilities on the same code are, uh, exist at the same time on both platforms, but the exploit won't work, which is good, because I don't need the exploit to work on the real hardware to know that the vulnerability is and if it's exploitable. So, so that's given the assumption it's really the same software. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're, we can, we can do one last question, uh, Doug, two more questions? Okay. It's the last talk of the day, so we're going to, we're going to spill over and have added time because of the interest. Okay. I think he comes first and then after that, you, is that all right? Oh, will you flip? I, I don't mind. I, oh, just, right, right. Uh, and then you come right. Okay. Uh, how scared should we be, actually? Uh, I'm here. Who's I'm here. talking? Who's talking? Here. Who's Oh. In front of you. Yeah, yes. thank you. I, I saw him with a microphone. I, I was expecting him to talk, and it uh, okay. was shocking. <laughs> Sorry. So, so the question is, how scared should we be? Um, is it possible for uh, countries to take over UAVs or something like that? Is it the same system? Okay. Again, please. Sorry. Is it possible for other countries to take over UAVs or something like that? Oh, UAVs. UAVs. Mean, yeah, drones. Yeah, drones. Yeah, although in Spanish, um, as I said, my research is about aviation, so if it flies, it should be within my research. I um, cannot give details on drones, uh, but do you have a talk in Spanish, that's a problem, about the preliminary results of one of the attack vectors over, you, of, over drones I did uh, one year ago. You have it on my website, should be, this is in German, so I will do it the easy way, which is all the way back. Um, okay, here, you can see the commandercat.com, there at, uh, at some point, and somewhere you have the link to this talk. It's in Spanish, but at least you can see the slides uh, about initial research I did on that. The only idea of the research was not to mess up with GPS, because it was already well known, not to try to attack the a command and control link that the normal operator uses because this is pointless, but to try to figure out another attack vectors, you have some information there. But I cannot talk about uh, ongoing research on this field. I, as I said, I focus on aviation. If it flies or has something to do with aviation, it should be on the mind map. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, the trend in the security industry is that the patch exploit to patch time is shrinking, right? I mean, it used to be, you know, quite a long period. It's now getting down to a couple of weeks, uh, hours if necessary. The quite correct safety first culture in the uh, aviation industry, of course, is to take as long as you absolutely need to convince yourself whatever you're doing is safe. So the Dreamliner incident going on at the moment has been running for a very long time and is costing Boeing an absolute fortune. Um, in your dealings with um, the authorities, are they stepping up to the plate in terms of realizing that, you know, they either have to ground everything, which they're not really prepared to do, I imagine, or they're going to have to really get to grips with, you know, changing their internal processes and procedures to be able to do things in internet time, which they've really not been used to doing. So, if I understood properly, in short, the question is how are those authorities, manufacturers and people going to face the solution of this problem? Uh, to be honest, I think it's on one hand too early to say that because we just been in contact for a few weeks, months yet, nothing is ongoing yet. But also, uh, as I said, I, f I feel comfortable with their initial reaction. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, maybe you have to ask them. They, 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 it's a huge problem. It's not easy to fix because you can fix, as you said, one vulnerability, two vulnerabilities, but the problem here is that the technology by itself, at least the one I have checked, is not secure at all. So it's not easy for them. I don't know how they plan to do that. I will keep you informed if I can. I don't know. All right. Thank you. I believe that wraps up the Q&A session and also it means it wraps up all the talks for today. Thank you very much, Hugo.